Welcome to Pentecost Sunday at Ingleside Church. In today's message, The Pouring Out of Holy Spirit, Dr. McLuhan explains the significance of Holy Spirit being given to his followers. If you've ever had someone make a connection for you that opened an important door and led you to a point that you never believed you'd ever reach in life, this message is for you. The Holy Spirit connects all who were ready to be connected with God. The Spirit of God is the one who unifies the message of God in the Bible from Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. In Genesis chapter 1 we read, Then the earth was without form, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. Uh, when we read about the Spirit of God hovering over the water, think of a mother brooding over her eggs and her baby peeps, her chickens. It's the act of birthing and bringing forth life. The Hebrew word for brood is the feminine verb meaning to tremble or to flutter or to flutter one's wings over her nest. The Spirit of God was active in creation, bringing order to the, and life to the world that God had created. And now all the way to the end of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, in the final chapter of the final book, this is what we read. The Spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires to take of the water of life without price. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 17. So who is the bride who is mentioned in the verse we have just read? It is the church. It is the birthday of the church today. And this is what the church is all about. Whoever over whom Jesus is the head, born to be first raised from the dead, and now the head of his church. That collection of people all around the world, above denominations and various groups, independent or connected, who know Jesus as their savior, collectively we're known as the church of Jesus Christ and his bride. And the invitation from the Holy Spirit and the bride is to drink from the living water that Jesus offered to all who follow him. This is why Jesus cried out one day in the temple on the last day of the feast, one of the great feasts he, we read, Jesus stood out, stood up and cried out, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And whoever believes in me, as the scriptures say, out of his inner heart or his belly will flow rivers of living water. John chapter 7, verse 37 and verse 38 who is hungry for the blessing of the Holy Spirit? Who is hungry for a thirst? Who is hungry for, for God? Thank you, Jesus, for what you are doing today in this message. Today, an invitation is being extended to you to drink deeply from the living water that Jesus offered to all. This is a water that quenches the thirst of our soul to have a meaningful significant relationship with Father God. Uh, you don't need to punish yourself anymore for the sins that you have committed. You know, many people punish themselves, hoping it will somehow appease uh, their conscience or their relationship with God. Come and drink life from Jesus. You don't need to try to earn your salvation any longer. People all their lives try to hope that the good will outweigh the bad. Jesus simply said, come Come and drink life from Jesus. You don't have to try to earn your salvation because you can't. Jesus did it for you. And so from the first chapter of Genesis to the last chapter in Revelation, it is the Spirit who connects God with us and with the Father heart of God. <laughs> Aren't you so glad? The Spirit of God is the teacher who reveals to us the deep mysteries of God. People puzzle all their life to try to understand some of the things that the Bible says so simply, 
And it's as though a light just turns on in your brain and you understood what you thought was impossible all of your life. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever said, ah, I get it. And it was just so simple that you'd struggled all of your life to see. It is the Spirit of God who opens our eyes to see that Jesus was more than a prophet. It is the Spirit of God who reveals to us that God took him took on the form of humanity in the person of Jesus. It is the work of the Holy Spirit who reveals that Father God, Father Son, and Holy Spirit are one person, yet distinct in their personalities and in their mission. You may have said that's impossible, but today the Spirit of God is making a shift in your brain to understand the words that I have just spoken. It is Jesus who made it possible for us to know the heart of God and makes it possible for the presence of the Spirit of God to live in our hearts and in our lives. This day, we celebrate the most important shift that God made in his relationship with humanity. In the Old Testament era, people lived in what has been called a visitation culture. I mean, you like it when friends come visit and leave. Uh, that's, a, that's a visitation culture, but I don't want that kind of a culture with God. I want him in my life every day, all day, night and day. I want him there when I'm not thinking about him, and I want him there when I am thinking about him. I just don't want to be in a visitation culture. I want to be in a habitation culture. And the habitation culture is when the Spirit of God lives in us. Now, what we meant uh, uh, during the, what, uh, is that when God came by the power of his Holy Spirit to do the, gives us the power to do the work that he has given us to do. That's the result of a habitation culture. After Jesus uh, returned to heaven, before he returned to heaven, he said, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will be in you forever. Because of what Jesus did on the cross for us, we now live in this habitation culture. By paying for our sins, it is possible for the Spirit of God to live inside every one of us. Every single follower of Jesus has the possibility of living in a habitation culture with God. He doesn't run away when you do things that you ought not to do. He's with you all the time, even then, helping you and talking to you and saying, you know, that didn't help you, did it? That's the Spirit of God. That's the habitation culture. What a stunning privilege. The Spirit of God is willing to take up his residence in every single follower of Jesus. This is what he promised to his disciples. I will ask the Father... And he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and he will be in you. John chapter 14, verse 16 and 17. Now, Jesus did not promise to send a human prophet. He promised to send the Holy Spirit, to live inside every person who received Jesus as his or her Savior. This promise that Jesus made pointed to the fulfillment of words spoken by Prophet Joel in the Old Testament. We've already heard these words today in the earlier part of the service. Let's hear them again. I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh on your sons and daughters. Isn't that really good news? They all shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions, even on male and female servants. In those days, I will pour out my spirit. And Joel is telling us it's for every gender, it's for every class, it's for every race, it's for every person, it's for more than Jews, it's for all people from all backgrounds. God is willing to pour out his spirit on whoever is willing to receive 
what he is offering us. This is the habitation culture that Jesus promised would be poured out very shortly. Now, after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, Jesus taught the disciples what this habit, more about what this habitation culture will be like. This is what he said. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. <laughs> what, what a blessing. I've been to some really remote places in this world, and there you find people following Jesus. What a blessing. There are still people waiting to hear, and we pray that our message will go forth to people in the remotest part of the world, wherever there is internet, we have an opportunity to share the message of Jesus. We're grateful for people who are going where there is no internet to share the message of Jesus. What did he promise? Power. You will receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, whose power are we receiving? We're receiving the Holy Spirit power. We're receiving the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. We are receiving the same power to do what Jesus did. The Holy Spirit in you and me enables us to do exactly what Jesus did. There was a time when I wished that I had lived in the New Testament and seen all that and Finally, my eyes were open to exactly what Jesus is saying. Don't wish for then, because I could just be with one person at a time. Now I can be with everyone through the Holy Spirit, everywhere, every day, all around the world. We are living in the best time. We are living in the best time to be alive and to be moving in the power of the Holy Spirit and his life, his power working through us in ways we could never, ever have previously imagined. Now, he didn't say, you're going to have to wait 500 years. He said, not many days from now. It turns out that not many days from now is only 10 days. And you find have trouble waiting for tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> 10 days can seem like a long time when you're really young. But the older you get, the faster time flies, isn't it? A day just goes by in a second. And Jesus said, don't, don't worry about, don't even think about 500 years. Just in a few days, what I promised is going to happen. Now, Jesus had already spent 40 days with them, speaking about all these wonderful things and what God was going to do. And so they just had this 10-day window of waiting, praying, thinking about all that had happened. On the 40th day, uh, when Jesus had this time with his disciples, his earthly ministry came to an end as we knew it. On the 40th day, he promised them they would receive the power to do everything that he commanded them to do. And so it was that as he was speaking to them on that mountain, he just simply ascended up into the sky and angels stood there, came down, and said, This same Jesus who was taken up to heaven will come in the same manner as you have seen him go. And one day, Jesus is coming back to the Mount of Olives. What a glorious day that will be. And we will be gathered to him in a glorious family of God. <clears throat> now, I keep saying it. You've already spent 40 days talking about the nature of the kingdom of God. They were just 10 days away from celebrating the Jewish harvest festival called Shavuot, or Pentecost, which simply means 50 days, uh, four, seven sevens, 49, plus the next day, the 50th day, the day this celebration took place. <clears throat> now, during the same time, the disciples were celebrating in the upper room where the Last Supper was. We believe that's where they were gathered. The implication in Scripture is quite clear about that. So there they were, celebrating uh, and praying and wondering and remembering. Well, there's a festival coming up. Will it be soon? By that time, there were only 120 known followers of Jesus. It's so hard to imagine, right? It's uh, 120. That's it. Now, there may be others, but these are the ones that were known. Now, the people in that room were such an interesting collection. The 11 
disciples, of course. Judas had hung himself. The mother of Jesus was there, the siblings, his brothers and sisters. The woman who loved Jesus and went around supporting him, they were all in that room. What a collection of people. We read in the scripture, when the day of Pentecost arrived, the long-awaited promise of the Holy Spirit came. In Acts, we read, a wind began to blow in the room where they had gathered. As you read through the Bible and as you read through church history, it's clear that the movement of wind often indicates the next move of God. Sometimes it's strong. Elijah experienced it strong in the cave. But God wasn't in that wind. Sometimes God is in that wind. It was a gentle breeze that blew. I don't know what kind of a wind that blew in that upper room, whether it was, had a violent sound to it or whether it was just the moving of air through the room. It was enough for people to know, with doors and windows closed, whatever's causing this air to move is something from God. <clears throat> and I believe someone listening right now, even in this room or over the Internet, is experiencing a gentle breeze from God. Pastor Margaret and I have prayed for people and they wondered if we just turned the air conditioning or something on because they felt a breeze. It's a token of God's presence. I've prayed for people in the room over the years who've said to me, I just feel a breeze. It's a token of God. If you feel a breeze, lean into it and say, God, are you speaking to me? Are you taking me to the next level? in my relationship with you. Pay attention to what God brings you that you can feel with your senses. We often get senses about something before we have an actual experience. <clears throat> the next thing we learned is that there were visible tongues of fire resting on the shoulders of all 120 persons present in the room. Now, as you were trying to put out somebody else's fire on their shoulder, you didn't realize you were on fire yourself. <laughs> what an extraordinary experience that must have been. You're trying to help your neighbor. Your neighbor's trying to help you, and you realize you can't put it out. You realize your clothes are not catching on fire, and you realize your hair is not being singed. I mean, all of these things, can you imagine? It was so God in that moment doing an extraordinary thing, getting the attention of people. It's how God got the attention of Moses, and it's how God gets the attention often through heat. And as I just spoke about people feeling a breeze, I believe someone listening to this message is feeling heat on your body. It's a token of the presence of God, and often heat is a token and sign of healing about to happen in your body. Whenever we pray for healing, we say to people, do you feel any heat? And it's just remarkable how, yes, what did you do to me? <laughs> Prayed for a man, he said, my feet are on fire, what did you do? I said, well, that's the token of the presence of God, and we prayed for his feet to be healed. You might want to, if you feel that heat, you might want to take your shoes off, particularly if you're watching somewhere overseas, because it's so important in your culture to remove shoes when you're in the presence of God. Just kneel before the presence of God. Open your heart and ask God to touch you. Uh, something may in your body may be healed. Touch that place where the heat is. Test yourself and see if you're being healed right now. Just a token of God's presence. And even here in the room, we release the healing presence of God. If you can test yourself, we encourage you to do that. Sometimes we don't know we're healed until we try a joint or feel a certain part of our body. Then suddenly we hear that all 120 persons, the men, the women, the mother of Jesus, Mary, his brothers, began to speak in a heavenly language. What an extraordinary experience that was. There was nobody to criticize anybody because everybody at the same time was speaking in tongues. They were not witnessing in this moment. They were not speaking to each other. They were not sharing the message of Jesus with lost people. There were 120 people locked themselves in the room. They were speaking to God in what sometimes is called a private prayer language. And this is language is available to all the followers of Jesus to talk to God 
in a code that the devil can decode. And when you talk to God in tongues, the devil doesn't know what you're saying. You know, a lot of us give our troubles away to the devil. You just keep telling the devil how bad God, <laughs> if you keep telling God how bad things are, the devil's listening and, and saying, amen, amen. <laughs> you don't get the devil amening. Uh, you want the devil to say, oh, no, she's praising God in that trouble. Oh, no, he's trusting God in that trouble. And when you cry out to God and pour your heart out before him, ask God to let you do it in tongues so that the devil doesn't hear what's going on between your heart and God. What a blessing it is. And, you know, I've learned it's easier sometimes to, to sing in tongues than it is to speak in tongues. Just get on a note and hum it and let God take you into a place of his presence. Begin to praise God, and all of a sudden you'll switch to a powerful communication with God. Now, following these things, the 120 people <clears throat> knew they needed to move out of the upper room. They couldn't contain all that was happening in that room, and they moved across from the city of Zion over to the temple steps. It was in front of the temple, where the teachers, or the rabbis met with the students. They'd met with Jesus many times and were taught on the steps leading into the temple. And all of the events that I have described attached, attracted a large crowd to hear what was being said. The next miracle that occurred was that there were international visitors in Jerusalem. This was the most international of all the feasts that were celebrated. And these people began to hear the 120, now not speaking in a language to God, but speaking in a language that they understood. Now, I don't know whether the miracle was in the speaking or in the hearing or in both. Some people were speaking a language they didn't know, and some people were hearing them in one language, but understanding them in another language. You can only speak one language at a time, whether it was Peter or any of the other 120, if they all heard in their own mother tongue and I'm sure there were some people speaking not just the national language, but the dialects of the world. Aren't you so glad God speaks all of the dialects of the world? And people understood the message. So the heavenly language they received in the upper room was transformed into an earthly language that was clearly understood. <clears throat> Either way, it's a stunning miracle resulting in people being amazed. And this is what we read. They were astonished, saying, Are not all these speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of them in his own native tongue? Acts chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. What a great experience this was. When Peter heard this accusation, God said to him, Get up, get up. Get up and speak. And Peter's going like, who, me? And the spirits go, yes, you. Yes, Peter, it's you. But God, no, but get up and speak. And Peter preached his first spirit-filled message. Men of Judea, and you all who you who dwell in Jerusalem, let it be known to you and give ear to my words. These people are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered by the prophet Joel, Acts chapter 16, verse 14 and 16. And Peter preached a powerful message, resulted in the people saying, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. It's a, it, it's a way of saying something went on. They understood something that only the Spirit of God could have caused them to understand about what previously, 40 days ago, 50 days ago, they had done to Jesus. And they said, what shall we do? They understood that the decision they had made to crucify Jesus, well, it may have been in the will of God, but it certainly was not what individuals, they came to realize that Jesus died for them. And Peter ended his sermon with these words, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive <clears throat> the gift of the Holy Spirit. And once again, salvation is being offered today, and the gift of the Holy Spirit is being offered today. What an incredible offer. Peter made it clear 
But what Jesus promised 10 days ago was being fulfilled at that very moment. The Bible tells us over 3,000 people gave their lives to Jesus that day, repented of their sins, were baptized, were filled with the Holy Spirit. And I hope you didn't miss what the people were offered was not just for those present in Jerusalem. It was for their children and for everyone around the world. The promise is for you and for your children, for all who are far off, and to everyone to whom the Lord calls to himself. Do you feel the Lord calling you to himself today to experience more of his power and presence in your life? If you've never received Holy Spirit, I invite you to just open your hands towards God and say, come Holy Spirit. He's in you, but you know you don't have all you could possibly have. You know you're not walking in all of these amazing things. Just open your hands towards God and say, Come, Holy Spirit. Give me more of your Holy Spirit than I've ever had before. And you're watching online. We invite you to do the same thing today. But perhaps first you need to ask Jesus to forgive you of your sin. Just say, Jesus, thank you for dying for me on the cross in my place. I receive you today as my Savior. Forgive me for hardening my heart and saying that Jesus was just a prophet. He's speaking to you right now. And your heart is seeing and your eyes are seeing with the eyes of your heart what you've never seen before. Receive Jesus as your Savior. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, if you want to be baptized, write to me and I'll help you figure out how to work with baptism. Even if you're in the remotest place, you can be baptized and experience his presence in your life through obedience and baptism. And If you've never received the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, come right now. Fall upon people who are watching. You feel something bubbling up in you. I know it seems strange. Just let it out. Take a note and sing, and then let God do for you. Took me about 15 years to learn how to speak in tongues. I'm very, very patient with people. And so I just release to you the gift of speaking in this heavenly language so that you have a code between you and God that the devil can't crack and you have communication with him. Thank you, God, for this message today. Help people to understand who Jesus is, to receive them as their Savior, and to walk in a spirit-filled life in Christ's name. Father, we in awe of your perfect gift of the Holy Spirit. Thank you that the Holy Spirit is with us to teach us, remind us, comfort us, and empower us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit daily so that we will carry your good news to the whole world. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope this message has filled you with living hope in Jesus. If you would like to talk to someone about your spiritual journey, please leave a comment or send us a private message. We enjoy reading your notes and having an opportunity to pray with you. If you received a blessing through this message, please share it with others. We invite you to become a Living Hope Partner by donating as little as a dollar a month through our QR code. Your gifts will help us create new messages and reach more people. Living Hope is a ministry of Ingleside International Incorporated. All donations for Living Hope qualify as a charitable contribution. Thank you for your prayers and support. Next week, we will continue learning together from the Word of God. God bless you and fill you with living hope.